Well, grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. The book of Jonah has been on my mind a lot lately. Our middle school and high school students in Sunday school are taking four weeks to read through the chapters of the book together. And through that material, I've been continually struck just how odd the book of Jonah is. Putting aside the great fish that we all know and love for a moment, this book is filled with the right people doing the wrong things and the wrong people doing right things. Let me explain what I mean for a moment. Jonah begins with God coming to this prophet named Jonah and speaking to him. Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. And this righteous prophet of God does what? He gets into a boat to flee from God's very presence. And on that same boat are some pagan sailors who know the storm that they face out on the sea must be the wrath of some god. And casting lots, they find Jonah to be the cause of all this mess. They beg Jonah to seek a solution. And when Jonah commands them to throw him overboard, these pagan sailors do everything in their power to avoid that fate. They throw the cargo off the side. They row until they can't anymore. And at that final moment when they realize there is no other option, they beg God's forgiveness for what they do as they cast Jonah over the side to certain death. The storm stops, and that great fish devours Jonah at God's command. And our responsive reading from a few moments ago is Jonah's prayer in the midst of that great fish. But this theme continues to our reading today. Jonah the prophet is tasked with calling the people of Nineveh to repentance. And like those pagan sailors, the people of Nineveh are the wrong people to call to repentance. The people of Nineveh were vicious and violent. They conquered their neighbors and dragged the survivors into forced labor and exile. Not the kind of people you would think to be receptive to repentance. But God sends Jonah. And Jonah, going a third of the way into this great city, gives us an eight-word sermon according to our translation. Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. A bare minimum effort, hardly a Billy Graham Stadium sermon. And against all odds, it works perfectly. You could not ask for a more thoroughgoing repentance than that of the city of Nineveh. The king himself strips himself of his royal robes, and he dresses in sackcloth and sits in ashes. He orders a fast from the most important to the very livestock of the fields. The entire city dons sackcloth and ashes, and they cry out to God. Let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that's in his hands. And who knows? God may turn and relent from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. It's the wrong people doing the right thing. A violent city in repentance. I think a model for you and I in our life of repentance. Well, let's compare this beloved Bible story that we make arts and crafts with in Sunday school with another beloved Bible story. Think back to a moment to the story of Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve find themselves in sin as they eat of the fruit. And God calls out from the garden, Adam, where are you? And Adam replies, I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. When God confronts them in their sin, instead of repentance, the man who walked and talked with God sought to hide and conceal himself in his sin. Consider yourself for a moment. God has come to you and to me this evening, shining a light into each of us, bringing to light all that we keep inside of us. Think about it this way. A burning lamp is being shown right into the darkness of our hearts. And What's your natural response? If you're anything like me, we feel like Adam. 
we hide. The Apostle John in his gospel even tells us this. He says, everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works be exposed. Who wants to have their sins exposed? Who wants their deepest faults, their gravest errors, their hideous actions to come to light? We naturally want to react like Adam. I was afraid, so I hid. One way that we try to hide what's in our hearts would be to confess those more socially acceptable sins. Yeah, I get angry with my family members sometimes. Yeah, sometimes I feel a little lazy. Sometimes I didn't really listen to my parents when I should have, but aren't we all like that? By confessing these sins, we figure we've done our due diligence. We've lived up to our duty. We've met the requirements, so to speak. We've come up with something to confess, and in a sense, thinking about it this way, we let the light touch parts of us while concealing and hiding those things that we're not ready for God to see as if we could conceal things from him. We treat it like a smoke screen so that we don't have to get into and confess before God the deep rage we experience those problems with lust that we keep hidden from the world, our greed that secretly drives our decisions in life, the things that we would be ashamed about if other people found out, the sins that do the greatest damage to our relationship with others and with our God. In a sense, we're treating the minor wounds to God's light while leaving the major ones to fester and disrupt every part of our lives. Another way we can hide is to move our thoughts quickly, to move through and keep our attention off ourselves. Yeah, I'm a sinner, but aren't we all sinners? Besides, I really will try hard next time. Perhaps my past track record shows that I'm not very good at amending my sinful ways, but if I promise to do better, I can move past this uncomfortable part of the service or this uncomfortable part of the church here, and move on to something less threatening. We fast forward through the painful stuff to get to that good stuff. But it's not what the people of Nineveh did, is it? They sat in ashes. They spent time contemplating their sin, which is another way of saying that they spent time being honest about who they were. Now, what does it mean to sit in ashes? Ashes remind us of the curse that God had pronounced on Adam and Eve. Dust you are, and to dust you shall return. Ashes remind us that our sins have catastrophic consequences. It's not just a matter of violating some arbitrary rules written in an old book somewhere. God's law determines the very structure and nature of the universe around us. So to sin against God's law is a sin against the way we are designed to function and live in this wonderful creation of his. The sin is not only to oppose God, but it's to fall short of what we could be. It's destructive. It's like knocking the walls out of your house as you're sitting in a pile of rubble. The sin is to settle for living in a hell of our own making, rather in the boundaries that God has established where life flourishes. But honest repentance means recognizing our sin, the destructive nature of them, and grieving them. To use the analogy from earlier, the light that shines into us shines into all of us. Every dark corner we push our faults into, every box where we push things down to keep it away, it means to stand before God with all of our darkness, all of our guilts and faults, and to see the enormity of it all. And as the light of God illumines our whole selves, it's here, truly here, when the whole thing is visible, we see what Christ has done for us. Remember, repentance comes in two parts. We spoke that earlier. It's first to be like the people of Nineveh, 
to understand the depth of our sin in our lives, to see what it is for what it really is. Then, to turn in faith to God. You see, our God knows exactly who you are and what you've done. He knows exactly who I am and what I have done. No matter our intention to hide and conceal, God knows full well. There is no mystery. God knows exactly who he is dealing with when he looks down upon us. This is the wonder of Holy Week. That a holy and perfect God would descend into our darkness. Dwell with us in the ruin and mess that we've made for ourselves. Then take that evil upon himself. To suffer and to die. That our sin... Our most grievous faults would not remain in darkness, but would be cleansed in his risen light. Not just covered over as if to hide from God's sight, but completely exposed, washed away. And the person you and I are be restored. This is you and I this evening in God's grace. The season of Lent, we sit like the people of Nineveh. We grieve and we mourn our sin. We are ashamed and hurt by what we've done and the brutal consequences of our sin. We see the fullness of it all. But this reflection makes what comes next all the sweeter. As we turn from the ashes and sackcloth of Lent to the light and bright that is Easter, we see the fullness of love that our God has for each of us. So my prayer for you in this remaining season of Lent is that it would be one of true repentance, a time to reflect, to confess, and to mourn our sin, and a time to hope and trust in the God who loves us dearly. And it's in his precious and holy name that we pray today. Amen.